second part of class, we're going to start doing our dialogue, okay? Because we haven't really had an opportunity to do that. You guys have been, you know, the hands-on in, in doing the x-rays and positioning, but we gotta we got to in, in, yeah, include the, the dialogue in here now and talking with the patient and then getting them ready for a procedure. Okay, so here we have the, the radius and all. Now I'll begin with the, the, the radius first. Um, so pay close attention to how the anatomy is set up. So the most proximal part, this is towards the, the elbow, is we have the, um, we have the head, okay, the radial head. And it's unique in its shape because it does look like a shape of a tire. Okay? Then we have the neck and then the tuberosity. What is the whole purpose of the tuberosity? Okay, if you guys looked at the, your definitions, you guys get a chance to look at your definitions? Like attachment of ligaments, or <laughs> exactly because most most bony anatomy is going to be smooth. In areas where it is raised or rough, this is where we have the attachment for any type of ligaments or tendons. So the radial tuberosity then would be an attachment for either a ligament or a tendon. The longest part of the bone is the shaft or the body, and then at the very end you have the stylet process. This is where we have our. Oh. Oh. What joint is this? The wrist joint, okay? The wrist joint, okay? Um, here with the, the radius in the carpal, you have the radial carpal joint. You guys remember that from last week? Okay, so the radial carpal joint here with the radius. Um, so when we're talking about the wrist joint, the only bone that articulates with the carpals is the radius. The ulna technically isn't part of the wrist joint. You guys got that? Okay? The ulna isn't actually part of the wrist joint. It doesn't articulate with the carpal bones. It's only the, the radius. Okay? So the bony, bony projection here is the stylet process of the radius. And then going to the ulna, you also have a bony projection. This is the stylet process of the ulna. The articulation between the two bones, the two bones is the radial ulnar joint. We have two radial ulnar joints. One is the distal towards the wrist, the other one is proximal towards the elbow. The radial ulnar joint. Okay? Now it's the opposite with the ulna. The head is towards the wrist. Okay, the head of the radius is towards the elbow. Okay, so the, the head of the ulna is towards the wrist. Long part of the bone is the shaft of the body. Okay. And then, going back over here at the proximal radial ulnar joint, there is an indentation, an indentation on the proximal ulna that allows for the head of the radius to articulate. Okay, so there is an indentation there. It's known as the radial notch. The radial notch of the ulna. The radial notch of the ulna. <coughs> okay, then we have a coronoid tubercle. Okay, tuberosities, tubercles. They're, they're rough surfaces for ligamental and tendal attachments. Okay, and the very <coughs> proximal part of the ulna is the olecranon process, which helps form the elbow joint. The olecranon process is that bony part of your elbow that you feel right here. This is your olecranon process. Okay, so that bony projection you feel is part of the ulna. All right, any questions here so far? All right, so now let's talk about the specifics of the elbow. <coughs> So we covered the radius, we covered, uh, we covered the radius, we covered the ulnar bone. Now let's talk about the humerus and its structures. Okay, so here we're going to be talking about the distal, the distal, um, the distal humerus. Starting with the lateral side, the lateral side, okay, which side is the lateral side when we're talking about the forearm? Is it the radius or the ulna? Radius. The radius, okay, so the radius is on the thumb side. So on the thumb side, the lateral side, first we have here, 
we have two very smooth surfaces starting on the lateral is the capitulum. It's a very smooth surface. Okay? Because when you are extending and bending your elbow, these two bones, actually three bones, have to move without any type of friction. So the distal part of the humerus has to have a smooth surface. One surface is the capitulum, which is on the radial side. And the way to remember this is, remember we said this is a tire? This is the hub cap of the tire or the wheel. So capitulum is on the radial side. The smooth surface within the medial side <coughs> is known as the trochlea. And the trochlea is associated with the ulnar side. Okay? So capitulum with the radius, trochlea, the other smooth surfaces with the ulna. Now you have two bony projections. Two bony projections. You have a lateral epicondyle on the radius side, and you have a medial epicondyle on the medial side. Epicondyles also have rough surfaces again for attachments of tendons and ligaments. But when you guys look at your definitions, you have condyles and you have epicondyles. Right? They are both bony projections. However, a condyle is part of a joint, okay, it's part of the articulation, whereas an epicondyle is not. Okay, so condyles are part of the joint, whereas an epicondyle is not a part of the joint. <clears throat> okay. Everybody good so far? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, in the anterior surface, in the anterior surface of the humerus, you have two indentations, or little divots, as I call them, indentations or divots, on each side of the humerus. <clears throat> on the radial side is the radial fossa. The radial fossa. So when you bend your arm, the head of the radius sits in this little divot. This is the radial fossa. Okay? Then you have another divot on the other side, the medial side, which is the coronoid fossa. The coronoid fossa. If we look over here on the lateral, the lateral picture here of the elbow, okay? Remember we have the elaternon process, which is that bony projection here on the back side. It also has an anterior projection or process, which is the coronoid process. So when you bend your arm, this pointy projection sits right in this little divot, the coronoid fossa. All right, questions? Making sense? All right. Now here we have the lateral elbow. <coughs> lateral elbow. So we know the olecranon process. Then we have the coronoid process. We have this curvature here, which is a notch. And this notch is known as the trochlear notch, also known as the semilunar notch. Trochlear notch and the semilunar notch, and they are used interchangeably. Okay. And again, we've got the divots. You can't see it here because it's superimposed, but, got, but you have both the radial and the coronoid fossa here laterally so that when you bend your elbow, the head sits in the radial fossa and the coronoid fossa sits in the coronoid fossa. Okay, we good? Golden. Golden. All right, um, what I want you guys to get familiar with here is when we are doing a lateral, one of the objects or structures that you see <coughs> is known as the concentric arches. I think it's <coughs> on the next slide over here, the concentric arches, okay? You're gonna see three arches forming here. 
North Korea bomb. So again, this is what you will visualize in a true lateral. Okay. These consecutive arches are formed by superimposition of the anatomy from the ulna. Okay. The first one is going to be formed by the trochlear sulcus. Now, I, did we cover the trochlear sulcus? Okay. The trochlear sulcus. The trochlear sulcus. Sulcus. Here's the trochlea. Okay. So this entire area is actually known as the trochlea. Now, when you look at this area right here, it's smooth, but then there is a, a groove, if you will, within this trochlea that is known as the sulcus. <coughs> so not only is it smooth, but it has a groove to it. That is known as the sulcus of the trochlea. Okay. So, these arches are first formed by the trochlear, trochlear sulcus, and then the edges, or the ridges, of the capitulum and the trochlea. Now, if I were to ask you a question, which position demonstrates the concentric arches, what are you going to tell me? True lateral. The lateral elbow. If I ask you which <laughs> position demonstrates the olacranon process, that best demonstrates the olacranon process, it's also what? Lateral. It's also the lateral. Okay, everybody got that? So the, the lateral elbow demonstrates your concentric arches as well as your olacranon process in true profile. <clears throat> Okie dokie. All right, let's keep on going. All right, here we have an AP elbow. An AP elbow. So what's an AP elbow? Anterior, elbow. posterior. Okay, so it's basically your elbow facing forward, right? In the two anatomical position, it's going to be facing forward. <coughs> so when you're looking at, at this, and we'll talk about the radiographic criteria later on, but I know this is an AP elbow because there's going to be slight superimposition of the radial head with the ulna, and slight superimposition of the radial tuberosity also with the ulna. Okay? So proximally, there's going to be superimposition <coughs> of the head and the tuberosity, whereas there's separation of the shaft. This is what tells me this is a true AP of the elbow. What do we have here in D? What structure is that? <coughs> the radius. And without looking at this, above the radius on the humeral side, it's going to be what? The capitulum. So the cap with the wheel. The cap with the tire. Over here, what area is this pointing to? <coughs> the coronoid process? Okay, it's around the coronoid process area, okay? And above the coronoid process, and remember, there's two smooth surfaces of the humerus. One is the capitulum, the other side is the trochlea, trochlea on the ulnar side. Okay? Then we have two bony projections of the humerus, and you actually can feel them when you grab your elbow. There's two bony projections on both sides. When you, when you pinch it, it's very tender. Okay? These bony projections are what you're going to be feeling or palpating during the different positions of the elbow. Remember how we're constantly palpating and feeling for things? These are two bony landmarks that you will be palpating to get you in a true AP, a medial oblique, and a lateral oblique. Are those two bony projections? <coughs> All right, and then here, what do we have in H? The olacranon process. Now, remember how you bend and extend your elbow. There is a fossa. There is a fossa for your capitulum. I'm just capitulum. Your uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, your capitulum in your.
trochlear, okay, so you have a coronoid, so you have two fossas. Now on the back side, for the olecranon, what do you think is going to sit right in the back of that humerus? Because when you extend it, this has to sit somewhere, right? In the back. You think there's also a fossa back there? Yeah. What is that called? The olecranon fossa. The olecranon fossa. Okay which is right about here. So when you extend your elbow, this projection is going to sit in a divot on the back side of the humerus. This is your olecranon fossa. <coughs> okay, so going back to, to this, this is olecranon process sitting in where? The olecranon fossa. The olecranon fossa. <coughs> All right. <coughs> the olecranon process. process, okay. Then we have these three arches here. What is the three arches called? Concentric circles. Concentric arches, and they're formed by three things. What are they? Okay, the sulcus, and the ridges of the capitulum and, and, and the trochlea. All right. What is M? What do we have there for M? Radial head. From the head, you, yeah. From the head, you have the neck. What is this projection here? It's going to be a rough surface. Radial tuberosity. Radial tuberosity. What is this area here? Trochlear notch. What's another name for the trochlear notch, guys? Semilunar. Semilunar, because it's a half moon. <coughs> and then here, I think it's just pointing to a general area. So I, this is your superimposed condyles and epicondyles. There. Okay. Any questions? What did we cover? Trochlear notch. Okay, we got all that. Okay. All right, so the elbow is a, a synovial or di diaphoral joint. That means it's freely movable. The elbow joint is both a hinge type, okay? It's also a tro tro trochodial or pivotal type, because you can do this, and you can also rotate your arm, <coughs> okay? So it's hinged and pivotal. <coughs> In your, when your hand is in a true AP projection, palm up, the radius and the ulna are going to be separated. Now when you pronate your hand, the two bones cross when the hand is pronated. Okay? And if you know that, you will know what position the elbow is in by just simply looking at the relationship between the radius and the ulna. So here, okay, here we have three positions, three positions. Remember what I said earlier, in a true AP, you're going to have slight superimposition of the radial head and a tuberosity with the ulna. So this is a true AP, like so, true AP, okay? Now, if I cross, okay, if I pronate my hands, what happens to the radius and ulna? They cross. So if this is this, then what's this? Because look what happens. The head is free from superimposition, and the radial tuberosity is also free from superimposition. It's going to be your lateral rotation. So it's going to be thumb down, pinky up. So we're getting the, the epicondyles in a 45 degree obliquity from palm up. Okay, 45 degree obliquity. Isn't that hard to do? I'm seeing Alex back there. <laughs> Looks like he's about to fall off his chair. Okay, he, she's trying that <coughs> external oblique. It's very hard to do. Okay, but we'll show you some ways of how to obtain that external oblique. Can you just label them right 
Okay, AP, mm -hmm. external oblique, internal oblique. Mm -hmm. okay. External is lateral oblique, internal is, another name for that is what? Medial oblique. Medial. Okay, so AP, lateral, medial oblique. Lateral oblique, medial oblique. <clears throat> All right. Again, we're just looking at the two bones of the forearm, the radius and the ulna. <coughs> radius and ulna. <coughs> Any questions? So for uh, <coughs> age, you said the radial head and the tuberosity are superimposed. There's going to the be slight superimposition okay. with the head and the tuberosity. Okay. With the ulna, right? With the ulna, okay. yes. And in an external oblique, the radius, the radial head, and the radial tuberosity are free from superimposition. What you're looking at here is the actual, it's called the, it's, that's. <laughs> you got a go? <laughs> so, always jumped all the way. So yeah, so in, uh, in an external oblique, pinky up, thumb down, like so, what we're seeing here is this is see a free from superimposition. We're seeing the radial ulnar, the proximal radial ulnar uh, joint at this end, okay. the radial ulnar joint. And then the tuberosity here is free from, <coughs> from, from <coughs> You guys remember the fat pads? Okay, fat pads are also located around the elbow. Um, they are extrasynovial pockets. Even if you don't see a fracture, the doctors, what they'll start looking for is any movement okay, or displacement of those fat pads, okay? I don't need you to know what they're, uh, where the location, exact locations are and what their name are. Just know that fat pads exist. And we look at that area, if there's any trauma that occurs in um, any certain type of joint areas, joint capsules. Okay, so now we've moved our way up from the elbow. Okay, what is this part of the humerus called? The shaft, okay, so now the shaft is easy, right? That's the body. It's always the ants that are more complicated. That's where you're going to find more of the uh, different structures. So here we have the shaft. Okay, let's start with the, the head, the head of the humerus. Okay, the head of the humerus is going to articulate with what bone? Scapula. Scapula. The scapula. Okay, so the head uh, articulates with the scapula, and it's known as the scapulohumeral joint, or we just call it the shoulder joint. Okay but specifically the scapulohumeral joint. From the head, there's going to be a slight indentation, okay, or a groove, and this is known as the anatomical neck, the anatomical neck of the proximal humerus. Now you have two <coughs> strips of rough edges of the proximal humerus, right off the uh, anatomical neck. You have what's known as the greater tuberosity, and you have the lesser tuberosity, the greater and the lesser tuberosities. Okay, and again, what do we know about tuberosities? <coughs> it can be rough, right, for what type of attachment? Ligament mm -hmm. and and ligaments, okay? Between those two tubercles or tuberosities is another indentation this is known as the bicipital groove, okay? It's in between the tubercles, so technically it's called the intertubricular groove, but I can't say it, so I say bicipital groove. Bicipital groove is more of a common term that we use in radiology. It's a lot easier to say. So that's the groove between the two tubercles or tuberosities, the greater and the lesser, okay? And then lastly, off the groove, you have another neck. 
and it's called the surgical neck. Okay, why do you think it's called the surgical neck? Because what? Surgery. Because surgery, this is the most common site of breaks in the humerus, is at the surgical neck. What population are you going to see this occur most often? Surgeries. Kids? The elderly. Oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we're all over the spectrum. I but see. it's most common with the elderly when they're, when they're falling and they're trying to break their fall. This is what snaps. Okay? It's a surgical neck. All right. All right, so here we have, um, what projection is this? AP. It's an AP. An AP of what? Shoulder. AP of the shoulder, okay. So let's talk about the different anatomy. So the, the joint, what is the joint called? Shoulder joint. Okay, we call it the shoulder joint or the scapulohumeral joint. So that's the articulation between the head of the humerus <laughs> And the scapula. And the uh, glenoid fossa of the scapula. And we'll talk about more speci the specifics of this at another chapter. Okay, right off the head is the true, Anatom what neck is that? Anatomical neck. Anatomical neck. Okay. True anatomical neck. Now you have two rough edges. One is more lateral and superior. Lateral and superior is going to be the greater tuberosity. The greater tuberosity. More inferior and medial is the lesser. lesser tuberosity. And you can actually see the two edges. There's one edge here, and there's another edge here. So in between those two edges, or tuberosities, is what? The intertubercle. <laughs> bicipital groove. Okay. You guys want us to say the, the harder way? You can say it. That's the bicipital groove. So that's the area between the greater and the lesser tuberosities. Okay? Now, uh, right below that, surgical neck. Surgical neck, and then this is the, the shaft of the body. Okay, very good. All right. Let's stop this. All right. So let's talk about positioning. You guys ready? <laughs> uh -huh. It's going to be the same idea. So yeah, so whatever we're, we're talking about today with positioning, um, you'll, you'll have to present that next week. Okay. So AP projection, the forearm. These are some key points here. So when we are doing the forearm, how do we prep our patient for a forearm? Okay. What do we need to get rid of? All artifacts. Any type of jewelry, okay? If they're wearing a jacket, okay? If they're wearing long sleeves, you may want them to change it to a gown, right? Although x-rays can shoot through clothing, with digital radiography now, even the, the x-rays can, pick up, on, on, can uh, pick up on some of the clothing, so including the folds. So the folds increases on any type of clothing, maybe mistakenly, be looked at as a, a hairline <coughs> fracture, some kind of anomaly. So we try to get rid of anything from the wrist to the elbow. Okay. Now, what about for the humerus and, and the shoulders? What do we need to get our patient prep for that? Yeah. Same thing, right? So to remove any clothing. Okay. How about bra straps? Yes. Probably yes, right? So anything like that. We need to clear out of any type of artifacts from the wrist <coughs> all the way to the shoulders and part of the clavicle. We get those all out of the way, okay? Including what? Also necklaces, right? Because if we're shooting up here, we're also looking at this, so we need to get rid of necklaces. Any dangly earrings. Because it's, it's the same concept you want to uh, you want to have the adjoining anatomy in part of yes. the study? Yes, yeah, so anytime we're taking x-rays of any body parts, you've got to include the, like you said, the adjoining anatomy. Okay, long hair. You might have to move the hair on the other side, the opposite <coughs> side of the trips. So these are things that you need to consider, okay? So let's talk about the forearm. So we're gonna clear the forearm of any type of jewelry and any other type of artifact, including clothing. Key point here is when we're doing the forearm, 
you want the armpit down at the level of the table or the image receptor. So the armpit has to be in the same level of the image receptor and the table. Okay? Because when it is not resting on the image receptor or table, like so, you guys, you guys see this? And my shoulder is a little higher, what's happening to my elbow? What's happening to my elbow? There's going to be some foreshortening occurring there. So all this from your wrist to your shoulder has to be completely flat. Keep the joint open. Right. <coughs> if there's any bend on the elbow, there's going to be some distortion. Because we're, looking, because we're looking at the humerus, so we're looking also at the wrist joint as well as the elbow joint, right? So armpit has to be at the same level. Elbow extended. We're including both joints, so we're including the wrist joint and we're including the elbow joint for the forearm. Okay. Collimate to the area of interest. No need for white collimation. We want tight collimation. What's the purpose of a tight collimation? There it is, yeah. Less patient exposure. And what about our image? Are we also improving our image? Mm -hmm. Okay. Collimation reduces patient exposure, and we're also improving the quality of our image by making it more contrasty, mm -hmm. more black and white because we're dealing with bone, right? More contrast, better detail with collimation, all right? Now, 